My name is Max Taylor, I'm a senior regional analyst at Intelligence Fusion and this week I'm talking about the TAPI pipeline. The TAPI pipeline is a pipeline project which will connect Turkmenistan with India via Afghanistan and Pakistan. So at the moment the four governments involved with the pipeline, so Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan and India are the primary driving factors. All four of them are very keen to get this project off the ground. It's been in the planning stage for quite some time now, so it's been delayed and delayed and delayed. So Turkmenistan will benefit quite heavily from this and as a result they're pushing, they're pushing for this quite hard because Turkmenistan will benefit by diversifying its energy markets. At the moment it's very reliant on Russian gas markets for its exports which means that Russia in turn has a huge amount of influence in Turkmenistan domestic politics and regional politics as a whole. Afghanistan will benefit quite heavily from the uh, transit fees for, as a result of the pipeline and Pakistan and India, much like Turkmenistan, will again have a chance to diversify their energy markets and diversify their energy incomes in order to supply their very uh, energy-hungry domestic populations that they have right now. And outside of these four governments as well, there's other push and pull factors too. So the US and the EU in particular are quite keen to push this, this pipeline project on because, uh, particularly for the US, this pipeline project is key because not only does it uh, negate Iran, it doesn't go through any Iranian territory, meaning Iran won't benefit from this. It also takes uh, influence away from both Russia and China, who two rivals of the USA who have uh, gained increasing influence in the Central Asia region. China more so at the expense of Russia, but nevertheless, USA has very little influence in Central Asia, especially with Turkmenistan, whereas China and Russia does. So for the USA, this pipeline is an opportunity to draw some of this influence away in favour of the US and the EU in some respects as well. On the other side of the coin as well, I guess you've got uh, China and Russia, as we just mentioned, they, they may lose as a result of this, of, this, uh, of this pipeline. They may lose influence and they may lose this uh, sort of uh, grip on Central Asian energy politics as a result of the pipeline, so they perhaps may be less inclined to support such a project. Security has been a really big issue for the pipeline and arguably it's the, this is the one reason why the pipeline isn't going ahead right now. And Afghanistan is very much the elephant in the room in this, in this respect. Pakistan itself has its own uh, security issues in the Balochistan region as well as the border region of Afghanistan, but not quite on the scale that Afghanistan has today. So what we're seeing in Afghanistan and what we've seen uh, for the past two decades since NATO intervened, as well as in, in the years leading up to that as well, is heavy insecurity. Rural Afghanistan is, a very, is, is, a, is an insecure area uh, with government, the central government base in Kabul often and historically struggling to extend influence into these parts of the country. Now the issue with this is the Tapi Pipeline project runs from the Turkmen border in the northwest of Afghanistan uh, in Herat province and it will run through Farah province, from Herat province, through Farah province, through the corner of Nimroz province and into Kandahar province. And all these provinces are very highly insecure and uh, all four of them contain quite large amounts of Taliban territorial control or at least Taliban influence. So therefore the for the planners of this project and for anyone, uh, any investors potentially involved in the project, uh, Afghan government influence in these areas is incredibly important, particularly as time moves on with the US troop withdrawal. I think uh, in Pakistan, which we mentioned briefly, the situation is largely going to stay the same as the militancy there has been ongoing at the same sort of rate for a number of years now. Whereas in Afghanistan, I think there's going to be a, a very significant change going forwards, and this is as a result of the US troop withdrawal. The security situation in Afghanistan is already in a very poor situation. Security forces are taking very heavy casualties. The Taliban are capturing districts in rural areas of the country almost every single day as part of a concerted offensive to try and put pressure on the negotiations ongoing between US government, Afghan government and the Taliban. And security forces are really struggling to maintain a presence in a lot of parts of the country, as well, including uh, parts along the route of the pipeline project itself. And the with the US forces withdrawal, this is only expected to get worse. At the moment, US forces provide occasional air support as well as logistics support, intelligence support and training to the Afghan security forces. But without this, I guess you could call it a safety net of the US support, there's already questions being raised as to whether the Afghan security forces can project influence into these rural areas, let alone defend uh, urban population centers, which this government's typically been uh, known to be able to hold. So this... Uh, so this potential for further deterioration from an already weak situation is very real as a US troop, uh, troop with the jaws take place. And just from the data we record at the company every day, uh, the, the sheer volume of attacks being carried out by the Taliban is actually quite incredible. And a lot of them don't even feature in local news, let alone international news. So the, the sheer scale of the security situation is actually quite hard to gauge at times, just simply because of how much data is coming through. It's 
it's it's hard to see how this how it could get worse if that makes sense but it's expected to with the taliban gaining more and more influence the security has always been such a major issue and it's it's almost always been a bit of an elephant in the room as well so Turkmenistan, for example, has actually already built the pipeline up to the border of Afghanistan, and that's where construction has stopped. And there's been some pre-construction projects in Afghanistan itself. But at the end of the day, if the Afghan security forces are struggling to even maintain control of their own bases in rural district centers, it's quite hard to understand how they will be able to protect the pipeline project itself. And it is worth noting at this point, actually, that the Taliban central leadership have actually, in multiple statements now, said that they support the idea of the Tabi pipeline project and that they won't attack it. But we've seen this in the past when the Taliban narrative from the central leadership has differed at times from the uh, tactical level commanders, particularly of those in Western Afghanistan, where these tactical level Taliban commanders at a district level or even a provincial level have quite high levels of autonomy from the uh, central leadership itself. And generally speaking, they do toe the line. So, for example, when there's been ceasefires agreed between the government and the security for uh, and the Taliban, these local commanders have adhered to that, but in th uh, themes such as protecting infrastructure projects in Afghanistan, such as roads, you can see quite clearly in the data that local commanders use their own discretion as to whether they want to attack security forces or constructing roads or whatever, dams perhaps, and others perhaps are more reserved and would choose not to. And again, this is about tactical level considerations, not just political level considerations. So yes, security does remain a major issue. And that question mark over whether the Taliban will be able to implement this agreement that they have, this statement that they support the project is a big question mark. If they, if they do, and if they do agree to completely prevent uh, any attacks on the pipeline, then that could ease the, the worries of investors and the politicians involved. But again, it's yet to be seen and there's, uh, there's, uh, there's very few guarantees that this would happen. So if it's found that completing the pipeline is just impossible, then the impact on the broader energy market, I imagine, will just be a return to the status quo. So what I mean by the status quo in this part of the world is Central Asian uh, gas markets are very insulated. At the end of the day, Central Asia is a landlocked region. Some of the countries in Central Asia are double landlocked, meaning that their options as to their exports are very limited. So, for example, Central Asia at the moment is very much under the influence of Russia, and albeit this has been waning in the last few years in favour of China, but the options are very limited for Central Asia. So they're, they're uh, energy markets are very limited. So they've either got Russia or China. Uh, uh, so for, they can subscribe to China's Belt and Road Initiative, or they can perhaps resume with their traditional sort of links with, uh, with, with Russia, which continue to go on to this day. But again, they do. They, if this pipeline project doesn't go forward, I'm sure we'll see more attempts from Central Asian governments, particularly Turkmenistan, to try and diversify their markets. This has been a big part of their development. And Central Asian governments know that if they want to develop further, if they want to become more developed countries, then diversification of the markets is key, not only for the financial side of it, but also to try and wrestle away some of the influence that Russia and China have in their own politics as a result of their dominance over their markets.